Good morning, good morning, good morning, and happy Sabbath to everyone. Good to see you, good to see you, good to see you again. Good to see you again for another Sabbath, Sabbath class. Uh, let us pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to open your word again. Just um, We've read these passages over and over again, Lord, and we're looking to see what new insights you've uh, brought for us that we can glean from the uh, pages of Scripture. So uh, be with us this morning as we go through this lesson. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Brother Jackson, good morning. Yes, everyone here? Sister Maureen, good morning. All right, so the, the, the lesson uh, number five, uh, the testimony of the Samaritans. And we are in the, we are in the quarter, and the quarter, the quarter is themes in the Gospel of John. Some themes in the Gospel of John. Okay, thank you. Um, so remember that, the themes in the Gospel of John. So uh, this, this lesson talks about the testimony of the Samaritans, and we've gone through um, numerous times the, the story of the uh, Samaritan woman, right? And the encounter with Jesus. That's lesson number five. Okay? And so we're looking today to see what new insights we can gain from the lesson. All right? New insights. So we know about the woman at the well, and um, uh, many times people have talked about, uh, well, you know, well, she, she had... Um, issues of her past, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of times people focus on that. But the Bible itself, the, the passage itself, doesn't focus on, on that at all. There was a conversation that was had between Jesus and this woman. And it was a very deep conversation. And so the question then becomes, when was the last time we had a deep conversation with Jesus? A deep conversation. Because this is very short, but we have a whole lesson about the conversation. All right, so... Anybody, anybody study the lesson this week? How many people showed by a show of hands? Yes, 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 yes. Good. Thank you very much. For those of you who did not, it's okay. It's all right. We're going to go through it. For those of you who did, I'm going to ask you. So we're talking about a theme. And the theme that came from me was, um, as I'm reading and studying, is, is that the theme for this lesson would be revelation. Revelation. I also thought about the power of one. I like that one too, but I like Revelation even better. What I mean by the power of one. One man, Jesus. One woman, Samaritan. One man, one woman. One conversation changed an entire community. The power of one. Anybody have another theme that they thought of? Those that study the lesson? All right. No? Okay, so I'll go with my theme. The theme of Revelation. So the, the, the lesson starts out with who were the Samaritans? And I stop right there. Who were the Samaritans? And the lesson goes on and on. And I said, okay, well, how am I going to attack this lesson? I said, well, the best way to handle this thing is to ask some basic questions. The who, the what, the where, the when, and the why. So the who. Well, the Samaritan woman is a who. Who was she? She had a past, and she was a woman, and she needed something. She was looking for something. She was in search of something. And that's why her life took the terms that it did. Who was this woman? A simple woman. Check her past. Who was the man? He's an exhausted traveler, hungry, he's thirsty, but he's also the Messiah, the Son of God. This is the who. But then we also need to consider the other who's, like the disciples. They're integral to the lesson, 
even though they're not mentioned much, but they're integral for the lesson because they were to learn something from this. So were the Samaritans, the people in the village, in the city. The what? This is the who. Now, what, what is it all about? The challenges they faced amongst themselves. The woman and her peers. Apparently, her peers, the other women in the, in the, in the community. Challenges her lifestyle. Challenges, obviously, her understanding of worship. Challenges of racial prejudice. Challenges, conflict with nations. We're talking about the what's now, the what. What is the lesson about? Challenges, understanding what worship really is. And we're going to get deeper into that, but we just want to set a framework for understanding this lesson. Breaking down walls of separation. So, so... So we get into the lesson, and we go on to Sabbath. This is Sabbath? Yeah, Sabbath afternoon. And so in Sabbath afternoon, we're talking about breaking down walls. A Samaritan woman. Okay, so let's talk about where, for instance. Where? So this area that we're talking about, it's between two mountains, Mount Garrison and Mount Ebo, and it's about a mile or maybe a couple of miles between, but it's a valley, all right? And you've got two mountains on the side. This is where Abram, when he came out of his country, and God says, I'm going to show you a land that I, uh, that I have for you, and he came into Canaan. This is where Abraham landed. This is where he looked around. And he says, okay, so this is it. It's going to be my, my, uh, my home, this area. This is the area, Genesis 12, 8 says, this is where Abraham built an altar for the Lord. This little plot of land is also where Jacob, when he was returning and he was meeting his brother, and he thought his brother was going to kill him. This is where Jacob came with his wives and his children and his flock when he came back. This is also, this place right here is where Jacob built an altar. This little area called Sychar, well, you got Shechem and you got Sychar, but um, they're pretty close to each other. And um, this is also the place where Dinah, the daughter of um, Jacob, was raped. This is where her brother's went back to the town and just destroyed everybody in there. Shechem was destroyed, pretty much. This is the plot of land where Jacob bought for his son, Joseph. This is the plot of land, this little area. where That's where the well was established, Jacob's well. This is also the place where Joseph was eventually buried when he returned from Egypt. So, I said all that to say this. The people that live there, we're talking about the Samaritans, have a, are grew, rooted and grounded in this piece of land. Their, 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 their lifestyle, their religious beliefs is grounded, firmly grounded in Jude, Jude, Judaism, Judaism. It's firmly grounded in Judaism. So when you have a, another group of people that says, hey, uh, you know, the, the Jews, <laughs> say, hey, look, you guys are, um, uh, you guys are, uh, uh, are worshiping differently than us and we don't want anything to do with you, you know, you can imagine their, their sense of, well, wait a minute, what are you guys talking about? This is Jacob's well. On uh, uh, Mount Gerizon is where the initial altar was built. What are you guys talking about? So you can see the animosity Okay, so animosity developed. All right, so let's talk about the, the um, Samaritans for a minute. So who were they? Who were they? So we know the place. So who were these people? So the Assyrians, when they came in and destroyed the northern kingdom, the 10 tribes of the north, and they moved them out. They repopulated with a group of people. Um, 
These group of people came from Assyria. Some of them were from Babylon, some from four other nations. I'm going to destroy their names, but I'll try. <laughs> C-U-T-H-A-H, maybe Kutta, Ava, A-V-V-A, Hamath, H-E-M-M-A-T-H, and Sepharvim. These are different uh, people groups that came and resettled and, popul and, re and populated um, uh, Samaria. So you have these five different nations come in with the remnant of the Jews that were there. And so they, they were made into a, a group of people, a new nation, so to speak, Samaritans. And so they had five different, they had five different gods. And, and then with their five and the remnant of the Jews there, so now you basically have six. So you have an amalgamation of religion. So it's kind of like really confusing. Okay, so this is what's going on. And then we're going to get to the conversation because that's where it's it really interesting. Yes? Um, my question, and I, it was in the study, but I don't remember. The Samaritans were called something else. They had another name before they were Samaritans. They were Jews. Yeah. There was a, it's, a nor, it's a northern kingdom. No, there initially. was a name, but I don't, know, I don't know if it was in Ellen White or the study, but I don't remember the name. No, no. Uh, now, if we go back to history, before Israel was divided into two, the northern kingdom, which comprised of the ten tribes, um, the, their capital was Samaria. Then the two southern kingdoms, Judah and Benjamin. So these two southern kingdoms, uh, they were commonly called as Jewish, Jews, Jewish, from Judah. And the ten are called the Israelite before they were taken by Assyria. In, uh, uh, before they were taken by Assyria. So um, the history tells us that most of the inhabitants of northern Israel the, the ten tribes were taken to Assyria. And uh, as what uh, Elder, Mike, uh, Elder Williams mentioned, that they repopulated it with the different kingdoms, surrounding kingdoms. But these people groups, they complained to the king of Assyria that they were like attacked by lions. So they found out that uh, the people group practiced their own religion. So what the king of Assyria noticed that they might bring back some of those uh, uh, conquered uh, Israelites to mix with the other people group so that they will be introduced into the true religion of the, the land before they were taken out. But because of that intermixture of religious uh, re 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 religion, their form of worship is different from the Jews in southern kingdom, like Judah and uh, Benjamin, it's different. Yeah, yeah, that answer you? Okay, good. All right, so now we go to um, the setting for the encounter. The setting for the encounter. This is Sunday's lesson, the setting. For, so now that we understand um, the, the dynamics, why there's this, this this uh, schism, this factions, why these people don't like each other. Um, let's go to the conversation. Because what's going to happen is now you're going to have a Jew. Now you're going to have a Jew having a conversation with a Samaritan. And they just don't mix. They really, really don't mix. They don't, they really don't mix. I mean, if you, if you were to ask somebody for like a, a glass of water or something like that, they just, you know, you would not get it. Something as simple as that. All right, so, so now we have the encounter where you have um, Jesus there. Woman comes to the, the woman comes to the well, and they have, they have this conversation. You know about the conversation. But before that, why did Jesus leave the area? Okay? Um, let's say your lesson says that uh, the Pharisees discovered that the disciples of Jesus were baptizing more people, from, more people than, they, than John. This situation caused a riff, basically, um, down on the last part. Probably to avoid confrontation, Jesus departed Judea to Galilee. 
probably to avoid confrontation, Jesus departed to Galilee. Um, Samaria uh, was basically the shortest route, and so he took the shortest route, possibly. Why did Jesus have to leave, though? Why did Jesus, would had Jesus have to leave Judea? Okay? To avoid confrontation. Confrontation with who? They, weren't, they were not in Samaria. They were still in Judea. Okay, hold that, hold that thought. Okay. I'm sure Jesus knew his disciples would have objected to what he was doing if he met with this woman at the well. Mm -hmm. Because the Samaritans were despised. So God had a mission. Jesus had a mission. So that's why he went to the well. Because he had to meet this woman. Yes, he had to meet the woman. Yes. So, but, but before, before, why did Jesus leave his area? But why did Jesus have to leave? Say again. Yeah. To avoid confrontation. Remember, he was in his own area. He was not with Samaritans. He was in Judea with his people. And so he had to avoid his people. <laughs> Jesus being the Prince of Peace, he knew of the animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. So he made sure that he had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the woman. Uh -huh. Her character was not too good. So he asked yeah. for the water and, and he mentioned to her her past. So she said, well, you know, this is, um, this is where we worship. She said, well, you worship here, fine, but you know, the time will come when I don't worship here nor there. The whole thing is, is that you, I can give you water that's not in this well. And right there and then she become an evangelist because she went to the people who were living. And, and, I'm going um, to get to that. I'm going to get to that. There's a lot. There's a lot. We got to go through, but I want to get this point across. He was in Judea, and he was having conflict with his own people. Right. Can we I haven't even gotten to the we haven't got to Samaria yet. He was having okay. This church brother was having problems with other church people. I want to get that clear. Before he went to this foreign country, he was having issues with Pharisees. He was having issues with John's. Okay, not only that, Pharisees, but John's disciples. John's disciples were saying, hey, this dude over here called Jesus, who just popped into town out of nowhere, is baptizing more than we are. So we've got a problem. So there was a conflict <laughs> between John's disciples and Jesus' disciples. We don't, miss, we don't want to miss that. Go ahead. Yeah, that's pretty much what I was going to say. So instead of being happy that people are being baptized, mm -hmm. right, focusing on the positive, it doesn't matter who's baptizing more than who, but that people are being baptized, they made it a competition. Mm. And do we find that in the church today? That's what we're trying to talk about. That's what we're trying to talk about. We're trying to look inward. We're trying to find out the lessons. And thank you, my brother um, and sister. That's the issue. Before we even get to the uh, Samaritans, we have an issue in the church. Okay? Jealousy. <laughs> They've got more than we've got. Okay. So the Samaritans were treated like second-class citizens. Dirty, unworthy heretics. And they were discriminated, discriminated against. Discriminated against. So, in terms of how we look at this situation, this encounter, um, someone mentioned a, a, a scenario where we could really understand what was going on, right? So, like, let, let's just say a, a black woman in Mississippi, like back in the 1950s, 60s, right? And a white man comes up and say, hey, uh, can I get a glass of water, please? How is she going to look at him? Suspicious. Suspicious. Like, y'all don't treat me right, so, <laughs> like, what's really going on? Confused. She's got to be confused. 
Jesus, what did Jesus do? Yes. He was breaking down barriers. First of all, he was talking to a Samaritan. He was talking to a woman. They don't do that, right? So, he's talking to a Samaritan. And he was speaking kindly to her. He was speaking kindly to her. One of the things that we don't get in the passage is the way Jesus approached her. It's not, it's not, his, 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 um, his approach isn't mentioned in the Bible. It's just that he's just, you know, having a conversation. He asked her a few questions. But in order for her to respond in the way that she did, it compels us to, know, to understand that Jesus had to come with a soft approach, kindness, calmly. Jesus, Christ-like character, right? Because if he had come through with, well, you know, you're, 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 uh, you're worshiping the wrong way. You know, you guys are like all upside down. You're bad. You're this and that. What is, what's going to be her response? Yeah, rejection. Yeah, this is the way you, you guys have always treated us. This is the way you guys have always treated us. I expected that from you, so therefore, eh, talk to the hand. There would have been no conversation. All right. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw water with. The well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as also did his sons and flocks and herds. Jesus answered her and said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I might so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water again. What is her understanding? By this answer, what is her understanding? She's intrigued, but she's, what's her understanding? She says, give me this water so I don't have to keep coming back here to draw water again. Yes. Yes. I'm looking at the important thing to say that the woman at the time of day that the woman went to the well. Thank you. The time of day she went to the well. When she the, the period of time that she goes to the well is to avoid people because of who she is. So she's going to get water that she don't have to come back. She's going to accept that water. And so she just quickly say, I need that water because I don't need to be coming here. Tell me how to get that water. But then she never see the spiritual aspect of it. She was just seen to avoid the people from coming to the well. Another thing I want to point out when you ask why Jesus went to Judah. Jesus went to Judah because of basic three reasons. One, to avoid the Pharisees. Two, to show the disciples that when it comes to salvation, every man is, is involved in the salvation process. So if you notice that they, they were hungry, where do you think they went to get food? From the Samaritan outlet. For the, for, for the Jews, it was not a problem to, to, to exchange commerce with them, but it was a problem to worship with them and to communicate with them. And that's how bad it was. So, number three, Jesus went there because he knew that the lady was going to be there. And she was going to be one of Jesus' top disciples of spreading the gospel in the Samaritan region. Right. Thank you, my brother. So, what we have to look at is this, this, this passage that talks about the Samaritan woman, I want to get this clear, is that it's not so much related to the story of the um, woman caught in adultery. This, this passage is more closely related to Jonah and his reluctance to evangelize the people of Nineveh. Yeah. 
So this is about, this is about evangelism. Remember we talked about what's the theme? This is about evangelism. Okay, so I want to, well, there's a couple of things I want to get to. Um, um, so, okay, thank you. We talked about that. Um, her engagement with Jesus. This water, this water theme, there's water themes all over this place, right? So that's another theme in, in, in this lesson, water, the theme of water. Water uh, encompasses like the greater part of the earth, right? The greater part of our bodies, physical being consists of water. Water is everywhere. Somewhere they says that we're, our bodies are made up of what, um, like 80 something percent of water? Something like that? It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Okay? So we're basically water. We're water beings. <laughs> right? We're made up of water. So when God made us, what did he do? He made, up, made us up with a bunch of water. Okay, so. It says in Genesis chapter 1 that water covered the face of the deep and the spirit of God hovered over the water. Right? We are made of water. Two things. We are made of water and the life emanating essence of God. His spirit. Because he says, and he breathed his spirit and man became a living soul. So we're made up of water and, and spirit. Okay, thank you very much. Without water, we die. We, we cannot, uh, 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 um, we cannot um, survive without water. We must drink water regularly to hydrate. We must get the life emanating energy from the spirit every day to keep on living. Water refreshes. The Holy Spirit brings life in our bodies, minds, and spirits and refreshes us on a daily basis. Water washes away dirt and cleanses us. The Holy Spirit cleanses our hearts and minds from sin, fear, selfishness, guilt, and shame. Water cools a fever. The Holy Spirit cools our tempers, irritability, jealousies, and rage. Water puts out fire. The water of life, the cleansing presence of the Holy Spirit, increases our faith and extinguishes the fiery darts of Satan. Water has three states. Solid liquid, and gas. God has three persons, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. When the earth became polluted with sin, water cleansed the earth. And in the end, the Spirit of God, the unveiled glory of God, will wash over the earth and cleanse it from all sins. Water symbolizes the cleansing of hearts and minds. What? Ba ba yeah, in, ba in baptism. Yes. So what was Jesus saying to this woman? Now let's go to lesson number, I think it's uh, Monday's lesson. What was Jesus saying to this woman? I will give you this water. What water is, what water is Jesus talking about? Okay, it's fine. Let's just take it on the, on, the, on the surface level. She had many husbands, okay? She had many husbands. Let's take it from the uh, surface level. Husband number one didn't work out. Husband number two didn't work out. And number three, and number four. So we can't find what we're looking for in number one, two, three, and four. But There's something one. that we're not getting. There's something that we're looking for that we're not getting, that these guys are not satisfying. What does that tell us? They can't do it. What you need is something else. Jesus is saying you need a conversion experience. What you need can't be, can't be got from a man. 
You need something. You need a change that comes from the inside. This water metaphor. This water metaphor. Jesus is saying that what I give you, what I give you, it'll be a spring emanating from inside you, right? The Holy Spirit. Okay, go ahead. The thing is, with, with this Samaritan woman, her first husband was the one that she truly loved. That's the man that totally destroyed her and that she gave up all, and that's why she ended up oh, hold on, hold on, having hold on, hold on. so many husbands. Where do we get that from? Pardon me? Where do we get that from, that the first one destroyed her? Wasn't that the conversation with Jesus? When he said to her about her first husband? Okay, so what, what's, what's happening here, and that's why I said that we, 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 we take what's given and we go in a direction about her lifestyle when actually what this is is, is an evangelism message because we don't really know the intricate details of that wasn't, that wasn't said in the, um, in the scriptures. The intricate details of her because I'm going to go a little deeper now. I'm going to go deep in a second. What time is it? No. All right. Okay, you're going to force me to go deeper. You're going to force me to go deeper. So these husbands then, let's talk about these husbands. Okay? You wanted to say something with it? Go ahead. You know, overall, when we look at the whole lesson, uh -huh. we can see that God is in the saving business. Uh-huh. He's not here to condemn. We tend to condemn people. When we look at this lady, you know, I mean, people, she was just cast aside. She was looked down on. But when we look at the whole picture in this story, God is saying, I can change anyone. I am capable of working miracles. And so when we look at people, we can see that you don't have to, we tend to have this idea that if you have a PhD, if you have whatever you have, that you're somebody. But God can use this, what if we want to consider them, them small people to do great things. He used this lady to be a disciple. And we have to remember that God is able. Um, with, with the woman, the effect that Jesus had on her, she was more effective than the disciples because going back to the disciples, how you know they were going back and forth about being baptized, how many they're baptizing. She dropped her, she dropped her jar and she ran. She goes, this man has told me everything about me. He's told me everything. She was more effective in telling them what he had said to her than what this, the disciples had. Yes, prejudice has, um, has what raised this ugly head in many different um, situations. And because of that, um, the, the message of the gospel has been truncated, affected in many ways by our unwillingness to reach people that we don't like, that we don't think are worthy and deserving. But the Bible tells me that God so loved the world. We seem to think that we can divide the, the, the world into little... Um, pockets of people and we would say over here these guys are worthy and over here those guys are not worthy we think we, we can do that but there's only one division there's only one division that the bible really talks about division of people that's the righteous and the unrighteous the saved and the unsaved all those other little divisions that we make tall short black white all those other divisions Samaritans, Jews, God does not recognize that. So let's go back to this thing because I, this is the main, this is the main concept of the story, which is the, the woman needed um, transformation. She needed transformation. Nicodemus needed transformation. 
That's what she was missing. She needed a change of heart. She was worshiping. She was worshiping. And I want you all to look, look this up when you get a chance. She was worshiping. Jesus says, go call your husband. Go call your husband. Why did he say go call your husband? Come on, someone talk to me. Hold that thought. Why does he say, she's talking about, oh, well, this water that you've got, I want to get some of this water uh, so I don't have to keep coming back. Why did he say, just switch the conversation up, go call your husband? Okay, hold on. I want everybody to hear you. To express herself and say, to give the correct answer, he wanted to hear what she was going to say because he already knew what she was doing. He wanted her to be honest and say, look, this is what it is. I don't have a... He wanted her to do a self-reflection, reflect on herself, reflect on her situation, and then speak it. Because sometimes we have in our minds what's going on with ourselves, but until you hear it, you don't really believe it or address it. So right, 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 right and right. She was trying to deflect. Well, was, you know, she knew what he was getting at, and so she's like, okay, all right, let's, let's talk about this water over here in this well, and da, da, da. You, don't have, you don't have any buckets to pick this water up. And he's like, no, let's go right back to the conversation. This conversation is not about this water right here. This conversation is about you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so that's why I asked earlier, what was the last time we had a conversation with Jesus where Jesus is asking us the question, asking me the question. Oh, my brother, we're going to have a conversation about you today. <laughs> okay. No, we ain't going to talk about the church brother. My brother over there, my brother over there, my sister over there. No, we're not going to talk about them. We're going to talk about you and where you are, where me, where I where I'm at and what issues I need to face and not run from. I need a transformation. Okay? Good answers. But a woman like that, because we know the type of woman she is, right? A woman like that, she has a very private life. People don't know about her like that. And if you notice what time she comes to the well, she's not even a part of the society. She separates herself because she has a private life. Now Jesus is messing up things because Jesus is asking her to call her husband, which nobody knows anything about her. So she does simple to avoid Jesus say, well, I have none. Uh, I need a mic in the back. It's just a sister, you, you, you know, yes. You, you got to raise it high. There you go. <laughs> Good morning, brethren. Number, I just want to add to the rest of brethren. The woman's life was a public life. Everybody knew what she was doing because she was having other women husband. And she and the women, the women never liked her because she was having their husband. That's why she tried to avoid them by going there 12 o'clock when everybody was resting. That's one of the point. The next thing, she wanted the water of life. And her life was not in harmony with God's will to receive that. And many times we are also praying for the Holy Spirit to fill us. We want that Holy Spirit, that living water, when we need to examine ourselves. Because Christ's Holy Spirit is not going to fill us when we are living contrary to God's will. We have to identify, as Sister Elizabeth says, what our situation is. Bring it to Christ. Repent of it so he can fill us with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And amen. So we go right back to lesson number one. Turning water into wine. Jesus turned water into wine. So... We have these clay pots that they had uh, uh, for, for washing, right? Clay pots. Clay pots made from something from the earth, They're <clears throat> just like we are made from the earth. So the water that goes in, that's us, water. The Spirit washes us, cleanses, 
that's the water, cleanse us, and then it goes into, turns into wine. The wine represents the blood of Jesus. So there's a transformation that happens with the water. Now, what, what's the, what does the water represent? We talked about that before. The Spirit of God, yes? Yes? So the Spirit of God transforms us into the Christ-like character that we should have, that we need to have, and then, therefore, we can say, hey, those that worship God must worship in spirit and truth. Can you worship in spirit and truth if you're not, you've not been converted? What is worshiping in the spirit? What is worshiping in spirit? Yes. A little point I want to make. There, Go ahead. there, there had to be a confession before there could be salvation. No one had to confess how many men she had and all like that. But if you look at the numbers, Christ was the seventh one. She was completed right there. Yes, Christ was the last husband she needed, the best husband that she could ever have. Also, the religion that she was needing was the religion of Christ. That was the last one. Um, okay, so, um, so we say that this, this topic is about evangelism more so than um, about um, behavior. Let me say. The woman's actions bespoke avoidance. Jesus could, re could read her heart. She must face her situation to find healing. Before the soul could receive the gift he longed to bestow, she must be brought to recognize her sin, and her Savior. Ellen White, uh, Desire of Ages, 187. And this is our condition. This is what this is really talking about. Right? Our condition. That we need a transformation within ourselves. Because we, without that, this talk about evangelism and going about this place and that place, we'll be we'll basically spinning our wheels. We need to start here. We need to start here before we can go there. Amen? my time is up. Uh, let's just uh, have a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for thank you for these um, these timely lessons that point us back to the things that we need to change in our lives, the things that we need to repent of, the things that we need to, to start to do in our lives, the, th the things that we need to change. Help us to see these as uh, lessons and, and, and messages from you and uh, and Father, help us to give our lives completely to you. In Jesus' name, amen.